welcome to the interesting podcast episode number 173. This episode is with TV writer, short story author, and one of my all-time favorite novelists, Jordan Harper. So I first became aware of Jordan when I saw this short film starring Ryan Hurst called Midnight Rider. And it was so good that I immediately went out and looked for anything else I can find written by Jordan. I ended up coming across his short story collection called Love and Other Wounds, and then his debut novel, She Rides Shotgun. Both are great. I absolutely love them and highly recommend them for anyone who's into the more kind of raw, real, gritty, you know, stories about the less than legal parts of our world. <laughs> They're so good. I will be talking about them forever. And as awesome as those are, the writer is even cooler. Jordan is awesome, and it was really cool to get to hang out with him and kind of pick his brain about stuff. He's just a great dude. In this episode, we talked about how he was originally from the Ozarks. We talked about how Midnight Rider came to be, trying to balance art and commerce, how the pandemic may have changed the entertainment industry forever, his take on writer's block, the importance of cultivating the artist, getting inspiration from multiple places, his writing process across different mediums, and so much more. Jordan is great and you're going to love him. Be sure to check out his newsletter called Welcome to the Hammer Party. And if you're from the UK, check out his upcoming book, The Last King of California, coming out later this year. Super pumped, little jealous of my UK friends, not gonna lie. But anyway, Jordan's awesome. You're going to love him. So let's just jump right into this. Please enjoy this episode of the Interesting Podcast, number 173, with Jordan Harper. Theme song time. Saturday. As soon as Saturday came out of my mouth, I realized I had no confidence that it was actually Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one. Oh, time is a time is a smear now. It is. It's, it's really a- strange because we're it's 2022 now. It's been two years of pandemic, and it feels like five years, but also like six months. I don't know what that I. Means. Uh, I you know they they were. Um, doing that end of the year stuff and uh somebody posted a picture of, of bernie sanders at the inauguration that was kind of a viral photo oh, at yeah, the the time. Mittens. and yeah and they were like <laughs> wow this was less than a year ago and my brain just like fell out of my skull it was less than a year ago it was a year ago that was a year ago joe biden's only been president a year oh my god what is happening yeah i uh <laughs> I was setting up a, a meeting. I'm a TV writer, you know. I was setting yeah, yeah. up a, a meeting with an executive at a streamer, and I was like, "That name sounds familiar. Maybe I met her in the in the past." And I looked it up. I found the emails. I had met her. We'd done a meeting together in October of 2016. Okay. And well, I was just times. thinking, "Oh my god!" Like we probably had a nice uh, little meeting about how well Hillary Clinton was going to be president. Soon. Sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> And, and the then world. life was just, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, I've lived an entire lifetime yeah. since October 2016. Right there with you. It's, uh, I don't understand it. I already have a horrible time perception. Like I have the memory of an Alzheimer's patient and just mm-hmm. the idea that it's still going. Time is still happening, but it's not, I don't know what it is. It'll be nice to say we're through it. You know, like remember the pandemic on the other side? But right now it's like, we're, we're still fighting. Yeah, we're just, yeah, we're, we're live. I can see, I can hear. All right, keep moving. <laughs> fighting might be a strong word at this yeah. point. Um, Existing is the goal. It's sort of like, you know, the, the, that when somebody's been kicked for like a while and they just yeah. kind of, <laughs> that yeah. posture. Yeah. Is, is that's <laughs> sort of where I think we're mostly at emotionally at this point. Yeah, I think so yeah. too. I think so, too. So you're not from L.A., though. No, no. I'm originally from the Ozarks. Oh, cool. What is that like? Yeah. Well, I, I'm from Springfield, Missouri, which is like the uh, the the big city of the Ozarks. Queen City of the Ozarks is cool. its official nickname. I and like it. It, it was, you know, it, it's an and it's an, an incredibly conservative area. Mm-hmm. Um, 
where I personally didn't fit in. And, um, I feel you. and uh, so it was a place that I, as a, as a young person desperately wanted to escape. Now I can see mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, it was a great place to grow up. Um, you know, it was relatively safe. It was, um, you know, I'm glad that like I went to a place where I was exposed to everybody up and down the economic ladder, Cool. which I see Helpful. a lot of people in LA seem to exist in their uh, bubbles, sure. uh, whether by choice or not. Um, right. And uh, so I'm glad about that. But no, it's, you know, um, it's, it's not quite the Midwest. It's not quite the South. Sure. It's, it's most similar to Appalachia. It's that gotcha. same kind of like Scotch Irish hill people who mm -hmm. travel across this country and then just stop it in, a, in clans. Yep. Um, yep. Um, in, in hilly places. And, uh, you know, I, I take a lot from that, like culturally, I think. Sure. <laughs> Um, but uh, from an older version of it that isn't quite as besotted with the the like uh, conservatism that that pervades it, and uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, like when I was growing up, the uh, Hammerskin Nation, which is mm -hmm. was a, a very violent uh, right wing skinhead organization, had their national headquarters uh, in my hometown, and uh, my older brother ran the punk rock club. Uh, in my hometown it was called Harper's Bazaar with an oh, great name and yeah and uh and we would have to like I say we I, I really wasn't that much of a part of it but like he would um you know, have to like kick Nazi skinheads out of his club and like good for him sometimes it got violent and uh and that's always been a, a why I've used like in my fiction I've, I've used a lot of um like Nazi skinheads as as the villains sure in my work um because like I kind of grew up um, with those guys as the villains, and it turns out that's great because you know they're villains. It works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not like where you grow up and you learn. Wait, I was on the wrong side of that. So right. Like, no, yeah. No, that was <laughs> correct. I was right. correct to be against that um, when I was yeah. a kid. That's so wild. I I guess I never put those two together because I'm a a big fan of your writing, oh, and thank you. I'm originally from North Carolina, very Appalachia kind of thing, and I grew up in extreme poverty. So there's a lot of things that is in your writing that I'm just now putting together that I'm like, oh, maybe that's why I like it so much. There's a lot <laughs> of, I see it. Like I've, I, yeah, I got it right here. I got it. Boom. Oh, nice. Uh-huh. Nice. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. This here. Oh, uh -huh. all right. Uh-huh. Yeah. But then your um, American Death Songs is almost $600 on Amazon. So congratulations. I will literally send you a copy. I, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean that if you, if you want one. By the way, it's literally Love and Other Wounds. It's that's what same. I thought. Yeah. I've been trying so hard because I've realized that some of your books ha went through multiple titles. Because I know yes. like She Rides Shotgun was originally um, or it was also All Roads Are Blind. But that was also the title, yeah. uh, A Lesson in Violence. Yes. Found out. And I'm like, OK, so they're not multiple books that I need all of them. I have it. <laughs> no, you know, and uh, the A Lesson in Violence is the is the UK title. Um, Got it. Okay. Which the you know my British publisher felt like people they don't use the phrase writing shotgun in the oh. UK. Oh, oh, then smart. <laughs> so you know what though, I actually I went along with it at the time. If I was doing it again, I would say so what? Like it's a cool there sounding phrase, right? She sure. rides shotgun. I love it. And also, like, I tell me what a reservoir dog is. Good point. You know. Good point. Um, the idea that a title needs to do anything more than evoke the spirit of a thing sure. is I think incorrect. And, and you don't actually have to know what anything means. You never care about what a band's name means. That's true. You know, um, you could just make up words too. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You can that's just fine. be Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> My favorite band from the eighties. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and obviously, you know, when it gets translated into another language, you, mm -hmm. that's a different issue. So sure. like, in Japanese, the, the literal translation of the Japanese title for She Rides Shotgun is Daughter of the Handgun, Ooh. which I know I was like, Ooh, pretty wait. cool. <laughs> I want to change the American title right. <laughs> if, um, if that's the case. But um, or uh, in, in Italy, it's like Education Criminale or, or something Ooh, like that. OK, yeah, which again, OK, all right. Little highbrow for Nate, but I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, 
but yeah, you know, um, if all roads were blind is, is uh, a line from a Bonnie Parker poem of Bonnie right. Clyde, which right. is used as the, as the epigraph of the book. Um, I think that might, that's a great title for a book that is a little more Cormac McCarthy. Mm, good one. And, and, you know, I, I sit in this kind of uncomfortable, or it's comfortable for me, but like, I think it's uncomfortable for marketing people. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> being between that. like the more poppy pulp stuff and, right. and, and literary fiction. And, you know, at one other time when I was coming up with titles, like I, I, I was going to call it green light. Right. And okay. That is, okay. That's a very poppy. Yes. You know, so. And McConaughey has got it now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> very different books. Imagine if somebody went to pick up McConaughey's green lights and picked up your green light, which is. <laughs> I kind of had that would be dark good background. for me in, in sales, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, I think so. The first the first time I became introduced to your stuff was the Midnight Rider uh, oh. video that Ryan Hurst did. Wow. Yeah. It was a, a while ago. And yes, I remember because I'm, I'm a big fan of Ryan Hurst. I think he's an incredible actor. And so watching that video, something clicked in my brain. I was like, this is really, really good. Because when you're an actor, you're around monologues all the time. You're like, mm. all right, it's a little, little turned up here, a little doesn't feel as real and grounded all the time. But that specific thing and the way it was shot and it was so simple and real and pulpy, I guess is the word. And I loved it so much that I went down the Jordan Harper rabbit hole. I was like, mm. what else has he done? Where can I get his things? And I've just really connected with your writing. I like it a lot. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. That's very cool. That was um, Midnight Rider was originally a short story that I wrote because I felt like I didn't have anything good to read at like Noir at the Bar events, oh, which cool. Noir at the Bar, Bar is like a nationwide kind of loose confederation of crime writers that do readings Sweet. at bars. That's yeah, cool. there should be, um, you know, you live, I'm not sure where you live close to Eric Pruitt and his uh, mm -hmm. He's the guy, I think he's in South Carolina. He, he would be mad at me. He's a very, very talented crime writer who does a Carolina-based noir at the bar. Oh, cool. Oh, wait, but you're in Florida now. You're just, so that's, that's Listen, immaterial. You think I won't travel for a good time, Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I didn't have anything good to read. I felt like none of my, you know, the fiction, live fiction readings are usually pretty bad. Sure. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's not, it's not written to be read aloud. Good point. And also very few of us are, are good performers. I mean, sure. There are, there are real exceptions to that. Um, Eric is one of them. Um, so I felt like I needed something that sounded good to be read out loud. And so cool. that's where that came from. And so, you know, I had written it and, uh, and maybe by that time it had published American death songs. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. um I uh, was just, I was at The Mentalist, which was my first TV writing job. Amazing. Um, but I was, and I was there for like six years. And I think it was probably year five that I just got bored. Yeah. And I approached uh, <laughs> Nina Corrado, who was a, uh, a director. Uh, at the time, she hadn't really directed any TV yet, but now she, she's a working TV director. Cool. She was, uh, she was a producer on the show. And I was just like, hey, you want to like, just make this like the cheapest version of a short film, which is like literally filming yeah. the guy talking love it um and i don't even she must have i suggested ryan hurst but she must have gotten in touch with him and we did it in you know an afternoon and he was very cool and i wow. would love to find something else to do with him because i agree i think he's great and uh it was really fun but wow i'm i'm glad that video one person yeah. saw it so. i know your stuff i'm the guy half of those views are me <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> no. it is it's really good because there's nothing like it. Like that's something that I like about your writing specifically is of all the books I've read and all those things that I watch, it's it's niche, but it's also like I don't like Taylor Sheridan is one mm. of my like favorite writers out there. I love the stuff that he does. And I equate you to him in a lot of yeah. ways where you both like are not afraid to tell like the uncomfortable side of a, of a story, but with humanity involved. There's like extreme violence, but also heart as well. And I don't know. Something about me as a as a reader wants those things, and I feel like I don't get a lot of it. So I'm very thankful for you guys. Well, I do. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I you know, I'm a I'm a fan of his, uh, particularly Sicario. Yeah, um, great. Yeah. Um, and I think he is working in a vein that I am 
trying to work as well. And it's a, a thing when I'm in TV rooms, I say a lot uh, this phrase, por que no las dos, which is like from a meme of a Mexican ad of, I uh, can't remember, it's like, do we want salsa on our, our, our quesadillas or do we want cheese sauce? And this little girl says, por que no las dos? And then you find out they sell cheesy salsa or something like oh, that. Oh, sweet. <laughs> um, but I always, in a, in a, in a TV writing room or, or, or even just when I'm working on my own stuff, I'm always asking my, like, por que no las dos? Like, why does this action scene, why can't this action scene also be a character scene? Why can't mm. this crime story also have interesting characters? And, you know, where he has succeeded in, in a way that really impresses me is it is really hard to market that. I, I do mean, yeah. like oh, what I was sure. saying earlier, that um, there are people who want, we have this really false bifurcation right now in our culture between entertainment Mm -hmm. and art and facts and so there's this bifurcation where people think well things can either be dumb and fun but like mm -hmm. it's kind of bad that you like it sure um or they can be smart and not fun mm -hmm. and you can feel like you're taking your medicine and mm -hmm. i think there are even shows like um you know a show i really like succession oh uh, great which is a candy soap opera it is dallas it is all that stuff but they have to kind of wrap it in this shell of displeasure they have to give it these yeah. like muted colors they have to make sure that everybody is loathsome because that audience that uh that particular audience can't admit to themselves that they just want to watch a soap opera sure <laughs> um, whereas with taylor sheridan and yellowstone it's that's a soap opera and, right. and it doesn't hide it. It doesn't feel the need to like hide the ball in the yeah. same way. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't watched a lot of Yellowstone, but I don't think it probably has quite the moral complexity and darkness of Sicario for sure. Um, where he has made I, what I assume is a conscious decision to, to get a little poppier in order to kind of get out of this no man's land in the middle. Yeah. That, used to have a much more um the, there used to be more of a tradition of this and like uh, you know if you were to switch over to talking about movies for a second michael mann yeah you know mm -hmm. uh, you're, which is he's one of my heroes so you know it i do think that uh people who work in this this vein it can be a little tricky to to, to find your spot you know what i mean sure and he's clearly taylor sheridan has he figured has, it out he figured it out and <laughs> and, and uh, i'm taking notes yeah, <laughs> I can um, see it. Yeah, is there like, do, is there a weird relationship with someone who is also like doing it for a job in a business where the art and commerce thing, oh, like yeah. making your art, but also it has to make money as well. Like, is that is that tough? It's got to be right. Oh, it's very tough. It, it, yeah. it's, it's it's displeasing, yeah, and I, I think that if you came uh, there, you know television's changed dramatically in the last like 15 years, obviously. Mm -hmm. And part of that has been an influx of people who came to television at a time when it was very interesting, when the Sopranos were happening. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm sort of in that wave in that I had fiction before I had television. Gotcha. Um, there's a lot of playwrights out here and people who came out here having already developed an artistic voice Mm -hmm. um and 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 came up in an art form where you, you would get notes from people but they wouldn't be commandments it would be like hey maybe punch this up or do this sure um oftentimes have a hard time making that transition um towards um yeah having to make because to me there's a, there's a difference between taking notes in a way of like because creating a story isn't an insular act it is it is a right it, by definition it is a shared act you are create you write the story the other person experiences it right um so you have to you can't just like my vision for me because that's at the end of the day that's just masturbatory it's not yeah good point but there's a difference between making changes or being aware of an audience outside yourself which is the necessary component of storytelling and making these changes that are just being made because some executive is frightened someplace. Sure. Um, and they are all frightened. That's the, that's the, if you want to know the truth about Hollywood, it is that it is a collection of very um, 
frightened people and they are what they are frightened of is losing their specific job makes sense you know um so when they're making decisions it's not about what's best for for the story it's not what's best for the network it's not what's best for the audience it's what will make me not get fired because right. it's a it's a very unstable job and i do sympathize for them they they don't want to get fired that's a human right you know, right uh, uh feeling but it makes it very frustrating when you are trying to do things that like you were saying like you, i feel like the the modern television audience let's just talk about tv for a second is underserved sure um and i think if Yellowstone is having an, an outsized success, which I'm not trying to take anything away from it, but sure. it's because there are people who just want a fusion of like the high production values, high quality of writing, high quality of cast that Prestige TV has, but coupling that with like stories that are trying to entertain them and, and that are compelling. And there's like a, a middle brow puritanical streak again in, in, in our, in our culture that, that, uh, like kind of a deep suspicion of fun that uh, really uh, makes what we do a little more difficult. I think that's going to change fairly soon. I think that cool. um, people are going to be aware of the fact that like the audience is, I'm not, and there's good TV now, but of course, you know, I think we are, you know, everything's getting redefined right now. And uh, I'm hoping that there will be some really co cool stuff that comes out of like the, the current reshaking of everything and all these uh, streaming services that have to make a name for right. themselves right now, you know? That's true. That's a weird thing about like that business specifically. And like, even with like auditions, everything moved to self-tape. Oh, sure. Like voiceover, everything, if you have a home booth, you're set up so much more because they're not doing in studio recordings for the last couple of years. It's, yeah. it's evolving. It's quite, it's crazy. Do you think the in room audition will come back when COVID is over? I don't know. It's been very interesting. It's especially with like, I, I, I've been an actor for almost eight years now. And specifically the last two with voiceover, a lot of it was like, you had to be in LA with the, you know, studio that they're working with to record. Mm -hmm. But since the pandemic, it was like, if you have a home studio, they'll remote record like primetime cartoons. And yeah. so the whole business model is like, oh, we can do other things now. It's I don't know if it will. I think if there are casting directors that have like a specific preference toward it, it'll probably mm -hmm. go that way because, you know, it's their house, their rules kind of thing. Yeah. But also, I mean, who knew we'd be here? It's so hard to gauge now because we're in unprecedented territories. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's going to be a question that, that gets asked at every level of, of the business where yeah. I think, I think TV writers rooms will come back for sure. They, they might not be universal. Mm -hmm. Um, I think because a lot of people are leaving town. Right. And, and, you know, um, they, a lot of the showrunners aren't going to come back, I think. And so Makes I think if the, if the showrunner wants to keep it on zoom, they will. On the other hand, having done a Zoom room, oh yeah, uh, it's not good. It's I bet. <laughs> it, <laughs> How many people are in those on average? I mean, it depends. I do. I do think people try and keep the room smaller. But I was in a room sure. with, you know, when you count the writers' room assistant and, and everyone, there were nine people in it. Oh yikes! Yeah, it's a lot. And and to do that for more than four hours a day is yeah, what you learn is literally impossible. Like you. Yeah. You pass the four hour mark and you just, everybody kind of shuts up because yeah. <laughs> their brains are, are, it's not the same as being in a room with people. Right. You're like vying for uh, 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 my turn. To, uh, yeah. Right. That's oh, <laughs> so tense. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, you know, a, a big part of, of my life before this was like, um, cause I live in Atwater village, which is, which oh, is cool. kind of uh, more East of in LA, just between Silver Lake and Glendale. And um, most of the studios are over in Santa Monica Right. Um, you know, and that on a bad day is a four hour round trip. Oh, um, because it'll wild. be like an, an hour, a little over an hour to get there. And then if you when you're coming west to east in in Los Angeles uh during a rush hour, it's oh yeah, the worst. It's I, your had day. A, <laughs> yeah, I had a I had a, a job interview years ago over in, in Santa Monica. And it, the, the interview was at four o'clock on a Friday. So I got out of the 
you know, the meeting at like five, five 30 mm-hmm. and, um, an hour and a half into my drive home, I called my manager and I said, I can't take this job. Like, <laughs> um, man, <laughs> like just give me, I'm not going to do this every day. I mean, yeah. I know people who have literally rented hotel rooms on the other side or not just hotel rooms, but apartments on the other side of town when they get a job wow. because it's not worth doing that drive five days a week. Sure. Um, it's a lot of time. It's it a lot adds of time. up. <laughs> but you would also just do that for what they call, you know, general meetings, which is like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm just going to go meet an executive at HBO or I'm going to go meet sure. an executive at Bad Robot or something. And uh, I think the days of us driving three or four hours to do a, a one hour meet and greet, I think those are just dead. I, I don't. Probably best. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and why? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know it's going to be interesting to to see what sticks and what doesn't. And um, self taping for voiceover, I bet you're right. I bet that's permanent because I think so too. But at the very least, opens a wing for it. You know, yeah. we're like they're not closing it off to like we don't do that. We only do this now. I think it's if it does come back, it'll be both because they realize the possibility it opens up. Yeah, I guess. I think that's that's true, and especially as the technology catches up, where I'm assuming your home studio mm-hmm. is not, you know, critically different. I'm exactly. sure the sound designer can tell some little sure. thing, maybe. I don't know. But right. Like, but nobody at home or you know? watching it on their phone is, you know. Exactly. And learning, like, there's a lot of voiceover artists now, because voiceover is the thing, like Jennifer Hale. Is, mm-hmm. you know, the most prolific voice actress has the Guinness Book of World Records. There's a lot of stuff. She just moved out of L.A. to Vancouver. And she's like, yeah, just doing her thing. Steve Bloom also, mm-hmm. he's in Hawaii now. It's like you can do it wherever now. It's been it's been an interesting thing where, like you said, people are so used to the way things are and they like to keep it that way because of security and that mm-hmm. now that the world has changed, it's opened up avenues to be like, oh, there's options. Interesting how this works. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's interesting. And I also think that, and I, I, I'm making a pledge now not to turn this podcast into a discussion of Los Angeles real estate, sure. <laughs> but um, as real estate in Los Angeles skyrockets, mm-hmm. um, the, and everybody's uh, incomes are in the creative fields are going down. Right. Um, it's not as, it's not viable the way it used to be. Yeah. Um, the idea that you're going to like, you know, go to auditions wait tables at night and live anywhere near the, the center of Los Angeles is, is that's becoming more and more difficult all the time. It's the same thing that killed the, you know, the artistic scene in New York to a, right. a large extent was it was all based on this kind of uh, this memory of when you could, you know, hang out with Lou Reed and rent, right. you know, a, a warehouse space in the Lower East Side and like, you mm-hmm. know, for nothing and dodging all the heroin addicts and, and, yeah. and, and creating art. <laughs> it's all and, part of it. It's the whole yeah. experience. <laughs> and, you know, by the time I, I lived in New York in like the uh, early 2000s, and by the time I got there, it was, that was really getting difficult, you know? And, yeah. Um, and now, I mean, I don't know how far out in Brooklyn you would have to live to have anything like that. Oh, yeah. You know, experience that people back when New York was, like I said, like a very interesting that creative hotspot. Not that, again, I'm sure there's really cool things happening in New York right now. Sure. But, but those but things cost a lot more now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And like, why, I, like somebody who wants to really, and like, you know, to, to get back to like the, my, my dream, and I think everybody's dream when they do this for a living is to somehow escape the bonds of, of capitalism. Yep. Which is very different. Again, I just really want to say it's very different than, than making something that, that is anti-audience because the mm-hmm. audience isn't the problem. The audience, I think, desperately wants to be challenged and educated and entertained at the same time. I think so, too. Um, so that's not the problem. But the problem is, is, again, like getting past these gates, particularly gates of like, you know, worrying about like offending or losing the audience. And this is not an anti-wokeness rant because- sure. Um, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, um, you know, oh, is this is this main character likable enough? Right. You know, oh, right. are we gonna are we gonna like this main character if they do something nasty? And it's like, I don't know. Did you did you watch The Sopranos? Right. You know, like, right. It's true. Um, 
And again, you, you pair that with, and uh, you can tell what my hobby horses are, but you, you pair that with like this, we're starting to import interesting television from other countries, which mm-hmm. is great, you know, to watch Squid Games. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. But as, and I don't begrudge the, the you know, Korean uh, creators of that show at all. I'm, I'm proud of them for, for getting that done. But yeah, Kill what me. I worry about is, is that, again, these, these scared executives are going to go, well, if we're going to do anything challenging, We'll just, mm. we'll bring that in from another country. So we won't have to. Sure. I won't get in trouble because sure. I didn't green light Squid Games. <laughs> right. Um, I don't have to assume the risk. Right. Yeah. And there are other countries where they're more eager to do that. But even just like to the extent of comparing modern procedurals on American television to British or Danish. Oh yeah. Procedurals, way different. Way different. And I, you know, my parents who are not, you know, like avant-garde people sure. devour Danish television, Scandinavian TV. That's awesome. Because all they want are mystery shows that are intelligent. Boom. Boom. That's it. And 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 have that kind of like, you know, again, like the excitement of a plot and a and twists and turns that are like part of storytelling. And I think there's a I'm just going down my list here of yeah. pet peeves. Um <laughs> sometimes we have a a novelty fetish in this country where it's hard to go in and say, guys, I want to do a really good mystery show for you. And they're like mystery shows. Right. Those those have been done. It's like, yeah, they've been done. It's like, you know, it's not a cliche that a car has four wheels, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, it's it's not a cliche (laughs) that a car has an an engine. Like, um, right. These are the things that make it go. And it works. It works. It (laughs) works. And, and, you know, much like formalist poetry, which is also out of fashion now, um, you can, you can build these walls that actually help you focus your creativity on like the moments, the, the qualia of the piece, the, uh, you know, just like the, it can still feel fresh and new and interesting. And you can reveal who the killer is at the end of the episode. Do you know what I mean? Like totally. It's like there's that thing. It's like all stories have already been told. You know, yeah. it's like there's X amount of keys on a piano. That's just how that's how it yeah. is. That's you can how it still is. Still make music like. And uh, yeah, there's like an impulse to try and make the exception the rule. Of course. You know, like you do something that is like exciting and groundbreaking because you've never seen it before. Um, and then when you do it a second time, when it's no longer groundbreaking, it's like, well, then maybe actually this is why we, we did the other way. Right. The other way worked. And then, yes, you surprised me when uh, you killed your protagonist at the end of the of the movie in a shocking way. That's cool. But that doesn't mean that you have to do that every time. Um, sure. But uh, I'm with you. I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this stuff. I uh, Good. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of part of it. No, I, you know, I, I don't know if you know, I, I have like a newsletter too. Um, uh, yes, you do. Welcome to yeah. the Hammer Party. Welcome to the Hammer Party, where I'm. I'm I've read like, all of them. Oh, thank you. I'm not messing uh, around, Jordan. All right? You're not messing around. <laughs> um, where uh, I'm working all these ideas out, and and uh, you know, kind of writing these letters to myself about you know what the point of all this is, what the. Uh, like, why do I do this? Yeah. Um, and the thing, and, and the, you'll know this, but I'll just say it anyway, is, is the thing that I've really come up with is that a story is its own justification for being. Yes. That like, you don't have to do a story for any other reason than to be a story that engages somebody else and and you take them through the, the journey of the story. And then at the end of it, they have experienced it. And by doing that, they have experienced emotions and ideas and they have both left themselves and discovered part of themselves. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. That's good enough, man. Like that's all it has to do. And that's the art. That is the art. And I think that that gets lost a lot of times in, in what we discuss. And um, so much like writing advice is rules based. Mm-hmm. It's do this, sure. don't do that. And my, I'm coming from like a different direction where, Basically, my, what I what I try and say in these things is if you cultivate yourself and, yep. and, and be true to yourself and watch the things that you like mm-hmm. and kind of like press those boundaries when you can, but like don't try and lie to yourself about who you are. Right. And, and then when you sit down to write, you only think about how am I going to transmit this to somebody else? 
Yeah. That's it. That's all. That's all you have. To, and it, and that rule. Work, what I like about it is that rule works if you're making a kung fu movie, mm-hmm. or a romance novel, or a comic book. Like yeah, it, that. And and you know, the more specific, I kind of feel like you can only give writing advice on that level of generality. Sure. Or the hyper specificness of like, okay, you have given me this story to read and give you notes on, and we can talk about this specific story. But anything in between, I think, is just like creating rules in your head that aren't helpful at the end of the day. I mean, how how many pieces of writing advice at the end of the day are really just like, don't do it shitty? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Which is um, a good rule, honestly. It, yeah. <laughs> you know? But like, it'll be like, oh, um, voiceovers are bad or or uh prologues are bad or right you know, um adverbs are bad that was a big one for a long time adverbs were bad interesting and i think you know a lot of times these rules that get thrown out and get totally like the the reduction in the total number of adverbs in fiction is a thing you could trace and you would see this downward sure slide and at some point i'm sure the popular trend was an overuse of adverbs. Makes sense. And so th- this rule of like, don't use too many adverbs was a reaction to some trend that is over now. Ah, uh, the pendulum now, swinging. Yeah. And now people are just ignoring this whole subset of words. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're, you've just, somebody told you it was bad to use. Right. These, this whole, like this whole category has been, I don't know, maybe just like be judicious. Like, you can have a and, little spice. Just don't cover yeah, the thing in it. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. I love your newsletter as well because there's a thing that you, like you kind of just mentioned, it's about find the thing that you like, feed that thing, and mm-hmm. then tell your thing. It's like the, the way that you look at things I really like because you're kind of cultivating the artist as opposed to like, here are the subsets of rules that I follow. You're like, your thing. There's a thing like riding the tiger, yeah. you know, and like, I, do, I like the way you see the world. I do. That's why oh, I was so glad you. you came on. Because like another thing that you said that really stuck with me was uh, your bit about Sisyphus. Oh, yeah. And you talked about the importance of talking about him walking back down the hill. And I was like, nobody ever talks about that part. You're right. Because he's got to do it again. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, what well, that is, you know? It, yeah. And it, like I said, it's, I, I, I'm really proud of that one because that one was uh, obviously written from a place of I get struck with very bad writer's block. Right. And, and there is a subset of people who try and act like it's not real or if they, you have it, you're like, oh, just muscle through it. Um, right. And there is truth that there is um, momentum in art that totally. like, if you, the more you work, the easier it gets. And you should try and work on a fairly regular schedule, not every day, but right. like, you know, you like I've been fallow intentionally for a couple of weeks now at the end of the year. And sure. yeah, it's, it's hard to get that boulder rolling from a dead stop. And that's just, but if you accept that and you go, yeah, right. that's part of the price is like you take two weeks off and then you have a week that isn't going to be your best week. Yeah. But like, so what, like, who yeah. are you trying to impress? Like what, what that. is this, like this deep need to not just, create but constantly create and sure and feed this this you know insatiable beast um yeah that gives nothing back really no it's it, like it, you're doing the work and the reward of the return is so temporary you know it is and and the the secret dream in our hearts of being a massive success i will tell you this this is absolutely true i have from working in hollywood brushed up against hugely successful people by the standard definition of success you know sure. people who are worth 80 or 90 million dollars right due, due to their creative things and i will tell you this the ones i've known who have been the most successful have all been miserable makes sense like miserable not just like oh they're a little unhappy like it was like oh they were probably not happy to begin with because i think to, mm-hmm. there's a certain level of success this is I mean this, uh, there's a certain level of success. I don't think you can get to if you're emotionally healthy. Makes sense. Because you would quit, or you would, you would stop making the decisions that led to that kind of success after a while. If you're healthy, if you're gotcha. healthy, you'd have a hit record and then you go, great. I'm just going to make records from here on out. Sure. You know, <laughs> you'd have I'm not going to, yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to, 
I'm just going to, you know, make my little $2 million art films. I'm just going to write the books that I truly want. And it's going to be for a very narrow subset of people because, Mm -hmm. you know, I, (laughs) you'll enjoy it. (laughs) Who will really enjoy it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And, but if you just keep on going, it's almost some kind of like, um, this is going all sorts of places here. It's, it's sort of a denial of, of death that I think is like pervasive in our culture. Yeah. This idea that like, you just have to keep doing the thing mm-hmm. until like, until you're literally dead. Yeah. Um, but there can't just be the, the, like, here was the period where I was pretty successful. And then here was a period where I kind of started to lay back in the cut. And then here's mm-hmm. the period where I didn't do anything at all. And um, in, instead of this idea of constant production, which, uh, you know, not to get, well, no, I mean, to get left wing about it, but to get, is, is just, that's just capitalism talking to you. That's it just, is. that's all it is. It's this yeah. idea that like, don't just write one book, right? And again, like God bless Stephen King, who is probably the reason I'm a writer in a lot of ways. Um, but man, you know, when you Google, and I've put this in the newsletter, when you Google how many books has Stephen King written, it says about 80. Yeah. <laughs> they don't even know. I mean, I do think he's, he's, a, he's a genetic freak the yeah. same way that a seven he's foot tall guy. Else. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, that's how I, and I might've said this in the, the newsletter. I remember when he talks about writer's block to me, it sounds like a, a seven foot tall guy saying, well, it's easy to be good at basketball. You just palm the basketball and then you just right. place it in the basket. <laughs> What's your problem? And it's like, which again, to get back to like what you're saying is why I think it's like, you don't want to read advice about writer's block from somebody who's never experienced it. Absolutely. You know, yeah. from somebody who, who kind of secretly just thinks, oh, you're just supposed to muscle through it. Right. Um, yeah. Put some dirt on it. Keep moving. Yeah, come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Again, the, the entirety of grind culture is not good, not good. It's Mm-mm. really. And again, it's like, what are you doing this for? Um, right. And yes. Yeah, so, so I'm glad to know you, you're kind of you're picking up when you say about like trying to cultivate the artist. I, yeah, that's that's kind of the only thing I can tell people to do. And a lot of it is, again, these letters are all at the heart of it written to myself. And um, the best kind of art is really when the artist yeah. is it from the heart. And, um, you know, I've been in Hollywood long enough where I, I have a little shame reflex when I refer to myself as an artist because same, you it know, sucks. you're like, that's, sucks. why am I so pretentious? And you're like, no, it's not. No, wait, hold on. Why do I think this? <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> you think it because we have to go out and make money. Yeah. Like, I don't have a choice about that. Like, right. I, I don't have a choice. Bills, about, do. <laughs> bills are due. And, and, you know, I, I do think that. I, I'm extremely lucky to have made a living in, in Hollywood for, you know, over a decade now. Yeah. Um, but it's also, you know, there are prices you pay and, and where, where I'm getting to in my life now is, well, okay, I'm paying these prices. So when am I going to start getting out of this? When am I going to sure. start? Like, like what is, again, what is the point of what I am doing? What when's the return? Yeah. And, and it's not to it's not to make money for the the investors in a, a streaming service. That's not. I mean, I've, I've I've talked about this a little online. I I have a new book coming out next year called Everybody Knows. I'm pumped. Which is a um, it's a big shift from she rides shotgun and a lot of my like redneck noir. Um, mm-hmm. It's it it comes from a place of uh, well, I I had done the LA confidential pilot. I had yeah. gotten very lucky, a real opportunity of a lifetime to try and adapt LA confidential by James Elroy into a TV show. Obviously it's made to a very famous movie in the nineties. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it didn't happen, which is, is upsetting, but I'm incredibly proud of, of the resulting um, good a pilot, which I'll send to you by the way. Oh, hell um, yeah. Uh, you know, Walton Goggins is in it. A lot of other really what? great. Yeah. Legend. Another yes. incredible actor. Yeah, it was. I mean, uh, The Shield is probably my favorite TV show of all time. Rightfully so. And uh, and so and and as much as I love Michael Chiklis and 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 his and you know his arc, I actually think that 
uh, Walt Walton's character is the the key to that whole show. And yeah. more importantly, he's the kind of character, or more importantly for me personally, uh, he's the kind of character I like to write about, which is somebody who does bad things and knows that he's doing bad things and yeah. feels bad about it, as opposed to kind of the sociopathic anti-hero that is right. um, more like what I would say Michael Chiklis's character right is in that show um but you know so i'd done la confidential and i i had really worked up this incredibly elaborate first season of twists and turns you know working off the book heavily but i was very excited to try and do something big and twisty and epic in los angeles and then uh, that fell apart and at the same time i was kind of feeling yeah, you know, I've been out here for 13 years now and my connection to the world of like redneck criminals is not what it used to be you know sure which i was never myself a redneck criminal but i grew up in the ozarks and you did your research <laughs> i did my research i you know um i certainly ran pretty hot when i was yeah. in my teen years <laughs> but um so i felt like i needed to make a change in my in my personal fiction and i felt like um i have another book that's just coming out in the uk in, in 2022 called um the last king of california which is cool. my probably will be my final redneck noir like grit lit novel sweet i'm in um and uh and then i after finishing that i i started working on everybody knows which is my taking that james elroy energy mm -hmm. um but applying it to the modern day um cool. and um and telling like a big epic la crime story which again I feel like there's this underserved um, area of crime fiction, which are these kind of bigger, more epic crime stories that, that take place on a lot of levels. I don't think there's anybody that I'm aware of in my generation mm -hmm. doing that. You know, um, Don Winslow is, is, you know, the generation above me, I think. Um, well, no, he is. I'm not going to. Right. <laughs> um, we're not the same age at all. Um, a few years, a few years. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I felt like, I feel like there's this, like, there's this kind of wide open expanse of stories to be told. And then I was also able to take all of this, like built up reserves of things I've seen in Hollywood. And, yeah. Um, and just my, my knowledge of what, the power structures are because that's when we talk about these issues of like bad people who you know this is not a me too novel because i don't think i'm qualified to write a, a me too novel but mm -hmm. obviously it's in that same space of investigating these like awful monsters who who the system doesn't just tolerate um the system actively rewards um but it was important to me like again like it's not a me too novel it's it's not about these people's victims and it's also not about those people themselves the people who interest me the most are the intermediaries the facilitators the people who do bad things because their bosses tell them to do bad things and then feel bad about it and in their hearts believe that that makes it okay that how you feel about the bad things you're doing right somehow like justifies it like gotcha like the cleaner the story that you had in love and other ones. Yeah. Yes. It's very, it's, it's, yes, it's, it's very in that world. I see the vein. Yeah. That's a, yeah. That story uh, is, is very much like the that story you know. is bonkers. Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's one of the ones that stuck with me specifically oh, your, your way of writing. There's I actually, I remember after reading it, I went into the room and <laughs> showed my wife. I was like, read this paragraph real quick. Oh my. <laughs> Thank you. you have such a way with words and I'm not just saying this, no, the I... specifically, talking about at the end when he's got the belt around him and he talks about like a like skiing or like water skiing oh leaning leaning back while strangling the guy and it's like water skiing yes like what a specific metaphor that's been with <laughs> me ever since it's like it's it's so perfectly put that i'm like i'm very uncomfortable right now I really because that's probably exactly that. what it is <laughs> that um for me what that makes me think of and, and i'm about to i guess by association compare myself to Cormac McCarthy but um Let's do it in in Blood Meridian there's a scene where you know they're sitting around the campfire and one guy insults another guy and the guy takes out his machete and cuts the guy's head off <gasps> and the metaphor that Cormac McCarthy uses and it stuck with me in that exact same way is his neck bubbled as if a stew 
Oh, and I God. Was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh. Ooh, I need to shower. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can picture that. I can picture like, yeah. Because with that, as if a stew implies a slow bubbling. Uh huh. And the, the temperature as well. Yes. And just the bloop, 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 bloop. Yeah. yeah. And you go, wow, that is really good. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> what is wrong with him? <laughs> And, you know, the other thing about like writing about right now is I feel like um, I'm very interested in conspiracy theories as as a uh, avenue of storytelling that Mm -hmm. does not require the conspiracies to be true. Sure. Um, And I think that might be a place where some of my new work, some people have a problem with because, oh, he's, he's, you know, uh, there's definitely an Epstein-esque air over everybody knows and my line about this it's i love american tabloid by james elroy which is largely about the jfk conspiracy um and i don't care if it's accurate or not i don't care if oliver stone's jfk is accurate or not it's an incredible movie and sure and also and i think this is really important whether or not a conspiracy theory is true it is about something about our culture that while there are moments in, in, in our culture or history that are over-examined, there are so many other things that are under-examined that these things start to stand for. So like whether, you know, no matter what's true about Jeffrey Epstein, um, the fact that the wealthy of this country can act with impunity yeah, is true. Right. And the, all you need to like take every single conspiratorial element out of it. All you need to know is that Jeffrey Epstein sexually abused hundreds of girls twice. Like the first bust didn't stick. Yeah. It was, it was four years of house arrest. And again, in some ways, the non-conspiratorial version of that is a bigger indictment. Yeah. Of our it's culture. true. Because it's just true. <laughs> it's just a fact that he did this incredibly monstrous thing to like dozens upon dozens of girls and did like what was it four years of house arrest yeah and it's not so, like his house is terrible so <laughs> like... that's exactly no and um whether or not he was was murdered um which is not in everybody knows it but um it's still my point is it doesn't at the end of the day for my purposes it doesn't matter somebody else should go figure that out one way or the other but like for my purposes he was because right that's the better story that's the story i'm trying to tell the story here and i don't have any um you know compulsion or compunction about that at all i i feel like our job is is to tell the story that feels again it's if you listen to the the thing inside you that knows what the story is it will tell you what's the story to tell sure and you know you talk about like you mentioned earlier the idea like I, i compare being creative to writing a tiger Mm -hmm. Um, but you are also the tiger. Yep. And it's really important. That second part is really important to me as opposed to a lot of people who I respect who kind of will take that line of like, I don't create my stories. They, they come to me from the ether and I am the conduit. I'm the conduit. It's really funny that like all of the aliens who whispered stories to film director, Russ Meyer, (laughs) <laughs> whispered movies about women with gigantic breasts that's right. just so like wow so he gives very specific just, very specific and <laughs> and again i you know you can't look at an artist's career and go wow this guy was just getting stuff from the ether no it was coming from him it was yeah coming. but like it does take a like a partnership with your subconscious that's how i feel about it it's like i agree and like recognize that your conscious mind isn't coming up with a lot of this stuff right if anything, that's it hinders true. them. Yeah, that's true. Um, and you know, there there is a a sleeping cop inside your head. Yeah, it's a um, piece of French um, <laughs> graffiti. There's a sleeping cop inside your head who must be killed. And that is when you talk about writer's block. I normally think that's when that sleeping cop has woken up, and is and again, you you need that editorial voice in your head at a very specific stage of creation, Mm -hmm. but it's not, it's, it's actively harmful the rest of the time. Yeah. You know, Um, I think so too. And so learning to like deal with that voice. um, And I think whatever, you know, 
uh, my friend Steph Cha, who's a, a novelist, um, she reads her bad reviews. And uh, I go, really? You read? She's tough. I, I'm too sensitive. Know, like, and not just like, not just like, oh, if a newspaper, I'm sure she doesn't get bad reviews from newspapers, but like, I'm talking about like on Goodreads. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think she would mind me saying that out loud, but like, um, it's just because I'm like, no, I occasionally will go to Goodreads. I will filter by five stars. Yep. And I will read those because you're not going to learn something from a one star review. Right. Of that somebody that you don't know and you don't trust. Mm -hmm. I, in my honest belief about any kind of art is a one star review. The only thing you can take from a one star review is the wrong person picked this up. Ooh, I like that. You know, um, and in fact, if you want to prove that to yourself, an interesting thing to do is go to your favorite book on um, Amazon, particularly a very popular one or one that's been around for a long time. So there'll be a lot of reviews. Sure. Go to the one star reviews and you're going to read a lot of reviews of your favorite book that are one star and you'll go, that person's an idiot. That person's wrong. Right. And then you'll get to one where it's like you go, oh, oh, OK. Yeah. If you see art that way, this is right. a one star review like this is one star sure. book. Like, the greatest book in the world to somebody it's not what they want and that doesn't make them right. dumb it doesn't make them wrong it just means that like oh these two things are like in totally opposing yeah um uh, forces and and so i don't think like you might learn something from like a three-star review right um where they go well i like this but i didn't like that but even then like you know find people you trust to give you bad news right <laughs> you know so that don't don't ever take criticism from someone you wouldn't also take advice from yeah oh yeah. that's good and uh but i do think it's like it's it's healthy to know that and it's also like i, I don't know i don't need to act again i don't I, there's so much weird false macho-ness in a lot of this it, it's yeah tough, you know oh i, I want to read the bet and i'm not saying it's about staff who's not, sure <laughs> not, not, not <laughs> portray yourself as macho but it's um it doesn't hurt me at all i could do this all day it's, yeah nope not true <laughs> no it's not true it sucks even like getting notes from someone you love and respect who likes the work there's always gonna be one thing they say where you go yeah you're right. I'm an idiot. I just right. Suck. I, oh I should just quit. Do you want to do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you take it. Go, Bye. Um, I'm waiting right now. At my my editor is going to be giving me his pass on um, everybody knows. Um, cool. And I should be getting it next week. And I kind of know in my heart that I'm probably not going to get any work done. Sure. Any meaningful work uh, done between now. And mm -hmm. getting his his notes because I'll be too like oh man, right? Oh boy, here, here it comes. comes. <laughs> and I just talked to him on the phone yesterday, and he was like incredibly kind and like he's you know it was not like oh boy, buddy, you you're sure it now. <laughs> um, but as soon as he hangs up, you're like, but was it real? Was that true? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I mean, a lot of it is like you know, be kind to yourself. Like, what are you? Yeah what are you doing? Like, did you really get into this when you were a little kid? And he's like, man, I hope when I'm an adult, I just feel horrible about myself because this yeah, is what right. I do. <laughs> man, I hate writing. Um, that's right. The, and, wor the world needs help beating me up. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and, and, and it's just like, I don't know, like whatever you, you know, I, I in my utopia, everybody gets to kind of, this is what they would do is just like, Maybe you, you help out around the house for part of the time. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the time you do the thing that is your calling. And I don't I care would live what there. that is. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why that isn't everybody's um, utopia. And it just, you know, the thing of like, you'd say like cultivate the artist, cultivate. I'm reading this um, French philosopher named uh, like Alan Badiou. Cool. right now or elaine probably i do um <laughs> i'm reading his, his book on ethics and i'm i'm like grossly oversimplifying sure uh, and also i frankly don't understand a lot of it but, <laughs> yeah. like, um, <laughs> but uh he kind of has this idea that um that a human being is not a person with a soul he doesn't use the word soul he talks about the immortal but sure. um he, it, but it's not that a human being is somebody who has a soul. A human being is a, a creature that can develop a soul. Ooh, I like that. 
Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. And, and that to me vibe very strongly with what I'm kind of working towards with with these newsletters is that it's not that if you're an artist, you're special. It, It is that everyone has this inside themselves that they can develop. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to write books or anything. It just means there's a thing in you that you are meant to be doing and, and you can cultivate that in yourself. And, you know, the other thing that he, it's a book on ethics and, 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 and I'm wildly trying to bend it towards art. Sure. That's, that's what I'm interested in is, is, you know, he says one of the problems with our modern society is that we, we define goodness as a reaction to evil interesting that like you know being good is protecting people being good is stopping the bad guy being good is like you know it's a reaction to something as opposed to it's like maybe the true true goodness can only be defined as a positive act of like what is your good mission to do yeah and i again you know go kind of full circle about the uh talking about my trying to avoid writing rules i think that's very close to what i'm trying to get at with, with, what, with what I'm doing with this newsletter is stop defining the act of creation by rules or word counts or, or goals other than like, you should try and finish things. You know, yeah. it's good for you to finish things, but like, yep. but that it is, in fact, if you just do the two things of like developing yourself and, and listening to your subconscious and, and kind of intentionally trying to better it without taking on somebody else's idea of what that bettering means so that mm-hmm. if you don't like Russian art films and they do nothing for you, then I don't really think it's a huge benefit for you to sit there and watch them. Sure. But there's something out there that does that for you. That is not just one narrow thing because you do also want to be cultivating your uniqueness. And right. I think where people get into trouble is, is when they let their um, influences be too narrow and too much exactly on the nose of what they do, mm-hmm. you know? So if, if you're a crime fiction writer and all you do is read a very specific crime fiction and then you're going to wind up pr- producing things that aren't that off. Right. Whereas the idea that you as a unique person um, can only be that by making as long a list of your influences as possible and looking at it and going, what makes this different than anybody else's list? Agreed. And, and, and how can I push towards that? How can I be, again, for me, it's like, well, okay, I, I have this deep love of crime and crime fiction. And then I also work in, in Hollywood and I've learned all these insider things. And I also, you know, uh, I'm a, you know, you talk about like my voice, I'm a, I'm a compulsive rereader. This is a thing that I'm, I'm, started writing the next newsletter. And I think this is what it's going to be about is, is ever since I was a, a little kid, I was a compulsive rereader. When I say compulsive, I kind of mean like sure. compulsive. Like, Last page to first page. Um, just, just, I would read the Harriet, the spy 40 yeah. times. I would read Tom Sawyer 40 times. There was oh, wow. this um, uh, crazy horse biography in my elementary school Sweet. library that I just read over and over and over again. And then, you know, then it, Stephen King books and, and then, you know, the Dune novels and then Hunter S. Thompson and then Elroy. And it, like, there are these, these books that I have read, I mean, a, like a lot of times. Um, and I only recently learned that that is a symptom of anxiety. Really? Yeah, that uh, huh. which I, I'm pretty open about. I, I have anxiety issues, but like it, it apparently it's it's a soothing mechanism because makes sense because you, you know you know. But and I'm not trying to suggest that like a, a you know mental illness is a superpower because that can get very very tricky. Sure. But I think when I look about uh, at how I write and the attention I pay, it's without trying to to sound and language, yeah, and voice, it's because when you reread something a lot of times, the thing that sticks with you the most is the voice, the patterns, the language. Right. It gets ingrained. It gets ingrained. But here's the important part. And here's the part that I'm, I, I think matters is if I was telling a young person who wanted to be a writer what to do, I wouldn't say, well, what you need to do is you need to read a book 40 times because it wouldn't work for them because it's not their brain telling right. them to do it. 
they, they and that's when you get to the idea of the tiger it's like you have to like well what is my where is my tiger already going uh-huh and how can i use that yeah to to, to get ahead you know again because i think you can nudge your subconscious but if you break it like a like a vegas tiger then you're not getting the benefits of this like wild animal that is like running sure inside you um and so you know that's just like uh, i've i've been aware of the fact that i reread and rewatch things um at a level that might be considered unhealthy sure um <laughs> and 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 i'm fine with that i i do try and nowadays make more of an effort to watch new things mm-hmm. so that i don't only you know sure um do this but but you make it work for you though that's important it, yeah and i'm i've been lucky in that i've always had a pretty clear idea of uh i don't think i've put this on the newsletter i have uh, i have these this triptych of drawings I did. Oh, I think I did make yes. it in the very first when you were really young. When I was like 10 years old, there's yep. like a like a little story of like a gang fight. Yep. And, I was and, like, like, this you, checks out. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. There's, there you go. I it, and it is a thing that I think I have been unconsciously successful at. And um sometimes, you know, it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, I, again when I was talking about I hope things are going to change for the better, thanks in part to Taylor Sheridan. Um mm-hmm. Uh, a truism in Hollywood right now yeah is that everybody only wants to watch Ted Lasso yep and this is what the executives are are telling us is we only want blue skies we don't want dark now I do think part of that is a reaction to the last kind of generation of crime television that was kind of comedically grim sure um you know uh and I don't feel like my work resembles that very much but i'm still being told when i go to meetings is like you know well we're really kind of looking for like a ted lasso type right. show. And, uh, to me i well i think that's great advice if you're making a half hour comedy which is what ted lasso is right um but don't you think the same person who sits down for like a slice of sunshine with ted lasso when they sit down with a crime drama probably want to experience a different emotion right ted lasso's um, ted lasso that's ted what lasso's it does ted- Yes. Well, there's also, you know, to get to like the idea of like the idea that Ted Lasso is successful for any other reason than its essential Ted Lasso-ness. Yep, it's true. That that people only like it because it's, they always want to be able to quantify why something is successful. And, and, and again, it comes from that fear where they want to be able, if the show isn't successful, they want to be able to tell their boss, well, it was, it was sunny, like Ted Lasso. So sure. I, you know, um, but like, there's nothing to be learned from that because, you know, if you make a show that is bright and sunny and, and happy like Ted Lasso, but it doesn't star Jason Sudeikis. It's going to be a not as good Ted Lasso. You're not making Ted Lasso. Um, you know, in, in, in my genre, a thing you hear a lot, and I, I will cop to having used this language myself, even though it's incorrect, is, um, oh, it's like Twin Peaks, people say. And uh, you go, is it really? Right. <laughs> is, it, is it really, or do you just mean it's like set in a small town and people are quirky? Right. Because Twin Peaks was made by a surrealist genius. So unless you have one of those, mm-hmm. it's and even probably, if you did, it wouldn't be the same. It, like it wouldn't be the same. No, exactly. And 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 I really again, it, it, this is all of a piece of the. You talk about this idea of like the the qualia or the the undefinable elements of something that can only be experienced by watching the piece that you could never yeah. describe we could talk about ted lasso um but you cannot experience what actually ted lasso is without sitting down 100 and, and and watching it and i really believe that shows succeed at that level like that is yeah. the, the level on whether or not somebody wants to watch a show is is in the the it's the combined like somebody who likes Yellowstone might not like sitting down and reading the scripts for Yellowstone. Sure. You know, um, yeah. it, it, it's the, it's the totality, including the script, obviously, but like, um, much like they wouldn't, you might like Yellowstone, but you wouldn't want to watch all the actors have lunch. You know, <laughs> like, That's right. And so I think that people, the, th- the problem is, is that that is um, an untested proposition. You can't, um, you can't create something until you've created it. Right. Yeah. It's true. So you can, um, I, uh, and I had a real uh, kind of heartbreak over the uh, the pandemic. I had a a pilot I wrote called Rat Kings. Ooh, great um, title. Thank you. Um, 
about uh, Florida drug dealers, actually. Hey, oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and kind of like the, the Tampa area, which I'm obsessed yep. with as a, as a setting. Perfect. And um, I was working with, I probably shouldn't say the director's name. I was working with a very cool uh, director who was going to going to direct the pilot, hopefully more. Sweet. And, um, and it was like this like scuzzy, but like with heightened dialogue, I was, uh, you know, trying to make it very pulpy and, and, and exciting. And yeah. Um, I don't know why I'm telling the story because the, 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 the end of the story is, and it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so about it's about the journey. It's about the journey. <laughs> no, that is, I, I guess I was just thinking about like something that like, I know in my head, like I can see what it was going to be. Yeah. And I know it would have worked. Sure. And I don't feel that way about all my stuff. Which right. Yeah. <laughs> very clear about that. Um, that's the risk of love, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You know? Um, and, and, you know, we just, we couldn't get any of the streamers, um, on board with it. And I, I feel like, again, you're talking about like these underserved markets. I, I don't think Sons of Anarchy was a perfect show mm -hmm. by any means, but I feel like there hasn't been a post Sons of Anarchy show. And I don't know why, because the much like up until like this, like two weeks ago, executives in Hollywood were pretending Yellowstone didn't exist. Right. <laughs> um, I don't think they can do that any longer, but they, they really were. Um, for the entirety of, of its hugely successful run on FX, Hollywood executives pretended like um, Sons of Anarchy didn't exist. I guess, you know, to be fair, there is literally the, the Mayans. Is, right, right. Good point. But, but that is like so totally Sons of Anarchy again that I almost right. feel like it doesn't count. Sure. Um, it's a spinoff of the thing, but that yeah. by definition makes it the thing. Well, yes, yeah, exactly. I feel but, you. Um, um, because I feel like, you know, I'm just like trying to find my home right now in, in television, someplace that will kind of let me do that vibe, yeah. my thing, right? You know, and, and uh, I'm hoping like that this, and again, nothing against Ted Lasso. I just don't think it should be the benchmark for crime drama. Right. Um, That's fair. <laughs> and uh, I have a, I have a new pilot that I'm taking out right now that is kind of uh, cool. It's my, uh, it's called Holy Mountain, California. Fantastic. And it, Thank you. And it is sort of my, it's uh, my pocket, my, my elevator pitch would be uh, it's Sons of Anarchy meets the X-Files. Um, I just feel like, you know, Dude. not to, like the, they should just give me money. That's like the right? perfect circle. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> they should, uh, I really feel like they should just give me money. Yeah. Um, let Listen, me make I know an actor. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I know, like, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. I'm just, um, uh, I, I'm not trying to be a downer on, on, on my, my career because it's, it's been really cool. It's just, sure, it is uh, the career in television and it happens at every level. Yeah. It's the, this like up and down, uh, you know, uh, you think that people at the very top of this can do whatever they want. And the truth is they can't. It's, you know, yeah. there are yeah. stories going around Hollywood now about incredibly large A-list names who just didn't get shows picked up. So um, wild. It, it it really it's it's strange and you know I wish there was more money in independent film now because I feel like agreed there's some really cool stuff coming out there and uh, I don't know how they make money anymore uh, particularly um, I guess you can sell to like Arrow or right you know um, Shutter but like. I don't know if you can make back a million dollars doing that. And I'm sure you know, like a million dollars is not a lot in the film world. You're not. Oh, definitely not. You're, <laughs> you're one location. Yeah. On a million dollars. <laughs> um, so I, you know, it's, it's just, it's, but it is, it's this constant fight. And I think that it's getting the, the creative field. It's, it will have its up and down and there will always somewhere on the spectrum be a wild west where people are looking to take chances. Luckily, yes, but it, it's it's a little hard to spot right now because these uh, the vertical integration of these massive companies make it um, there's less competition because now it's the competition used to if this gets too inside baseball let me know but like I love it competition for 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 television films used to happen at the studio level so like Warner Brothers would develop a TV show and then they would take it all around town and the you know the networks and the cable companies who are all competing for audience would, would take chances because um, 
they were fighting for audience share all the time. And, and there was a feeling of like, well, you, you know, obviously you make your safe choices, but also you would take these, these shots because um, if you didn't, if you didn't buy this show, well, mm-hmm. your competitor might. Uh, and what if okay. it's the big hit, right? So you're sure. in competition. But now what's happening with vertical integration, which means that now say Amazon Studios is making a TV show for Amazon, right? Right. Um, well, okay. So you take them your weird idea and they go, well, it's kind of weird. It might not work. And if we say no, it will never happen. Yikes. So you're not going to lose it to the guys across the street, you know? Sure. Because even independent studios are having a hard time selling to anybody now because everybody's mission is to save money for their corporation and you save money by going to your people. And, you know, so now your studio is making the profit off your network. And so it's all staying in house and that's a better deal for them than it is to, to buy from somebody else. So there's a level where the competition has been like basically removed. It is, because they're doing their own things, not in relation to one another. Yeah, exactly. And, and that leads to a natural, when I say conservatism, I don't mean that in a political way. I mean it sure. in, a, in an artistic way, oh, though also in a, a, a different kind of political way where there is a, right. you know, a, a subset of, of, of politics that, that rarely makes it to the air. But like, that's not really my point, though. It's, it's just a, well, let's do the safe thing. Let's do, people want to know why there are so many reboots, right? And right. The safe bet. It's a safe bet. Not only that, it's like, hey, guys, we own this. Right. So you can do whatever they want with it. Well, we, we should do something with it, right? We own it. So right. when, you, when you see something coming out and you go, man, nobody wanted a, a reboot of The Lone Ranger. I'm just picking The Lone Ranger. Um, sure. Because I, I actually don't know if that's public domain or not. But let's just pretend for a minute it's not public domain. That like It's because somebody owned The Lone Ranger. And it's like, well, what are we going to do? Not make a Lone Ranger? And it's like, well, right. Well, nobody cares about it. It's like, well, that's not the point the point is we own it right we have the toy we have the toy well with so, it. yeah what are we gonna do like do something new that we don't own and right can't control what if they don't like the new toy <laughs> what if they don't like the new toy um and this is the like the the weirdest idea that i can i can <laughs> this is where i'm really trying to wrap my own head around this is is trying to understand that in a very essential way television isn't made to be watched anymore interesting and what, what I mean by that is, so like, let's say you don't subscribe to a streaming service, right? Okay. And then you hear about a show. It's a very talked about show. And you go, well, I might want to watch that someday, right? Mm-hmm. And so you sign up for the streaming service. Um, and then you never watch the show. Why do they care? Right. It's about paying the door charge. It's about paying the door charge. And I literally, and I will not name names but like i literally had an executive tell me that like their whole business model was based on getting people to sign up because it wasn't that much money and then he didn't say Mm -hmm. this part out loud but it was clear it's like once you sign up you kind of forget right you know of course so maybe you keep maybe you watch something else but their their whole thing was we just need to get them in the door that's all we have to do is get them in the door because once they're in we've got them right um and you go, man, that's a creative person. That is a that is disheartening. This is not what I wanted, <laughs> that is not what I wanted to hear at this meeting. That right. Not, well, I, I, I did not put on an, a shirt for uh, right. For this, for I did this. not rustle up some self-worth and confidence for this. <laughs> no, and and um and, and you start to understand, like, and again, to take two very different shows, if you were to just look at Twitter mm-hmm. and figure out what the comparative audiences are between Yellowstone and Succession. Oh, yeah. You would think from Twitter mm-hmm. that Succession had probably 10 times the audience that Yellowstone did. Correct. And the inverse is true. Right. Like, it's, I think that might actually be accurate to say, but I think you're right. 10 times the audience that Succession has. But the, you know, um, the demographic that is on Twitter mm-hmm. is both the demographic of people who make television mm-hmm. and the people who write about television. Right. And the people who watch the kind of shows that people who write about television watch. It's its, its own kind of bubble. It, it, it's very much a bubble. It's a bubble of Los Angeles and New York to a huge extent. And when people 
particularly like people in like um, other parts of the country talk about that, they are completely correct that it is it is a, a it is a bubble that does not care about what people in large swaths of the rest of the country um, care about, or if they do care about it, it's in a very disdainful way that assumes everybody in the middle of the country is like a, you know, a, a rampant bigot. Sure. Um, they wouldn't get it kind of they thing. They wouldn't get very it. Dismissive. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, you know, or, or, or TV shows like uh, that are almost made with disdain. Sure. You know, the kind of um, very bad network show. So like, here you, here's, here's your slop. Yeah. You like this? <laughs> Enjoy you this. Go. You enjoy this. Well, it's like, kind of, uh... <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Which is again, you know, talk about like being glad about being from the Ozarks and, and being exposed to like people on all parts of the economic ladder is I interact with people in, in this town a lot who don't have that experience. And right. And again, have like make these assumptions about other parts of the country that you kind of go, this is wild what you're saying. Like right. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, there are there are like not just liberals, but there are like weird shaved head punk rock people in like the reddest place you can imagine there yep. are people of color in kansas like a lot yeah, that's of true. people of color in kansas and you could make an entire tv show about it if you wanted to you know um absolutely and there are people who just who are neither who don't care about politics at all yeah who just absolutely. don't don't care um and you know, and try not to get too political here, but like kind of have a reason not to care because nobody yep. cares about them. And totally to ask somebody who you don't care about to care about you is a, um, it's an unfair proposition. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm right there with you. Is it different to like when, when you're writing different mediums, like writing for TV versus writing like short stories, writing like your novels, is your process different for each one? Oh, um, that's interesting. Um, well, the thing about novels is that they are very hard. I they, bet. Are, they are very hard to write. And my, my friends who are only TV writers uh, sometimes don't understand that. Or they do, and they'll go, yeah, I don't know why you do that. Because sure. <laughs> TV is, is, is much easier. So that, like, to write a novel is, is to like plan for a marathon. You know, you, gotcha. you kind of have to, you do it in stages, I have not completed a novel inside of 365 days and sure. I've never done it in a year. It takes me more than a year to do a novel. Um, Makes sense. So like, um, so that is an incredibly different process, but um, I really, over the pandemic, um, really refined my work schedule in a way that it has become universal, which is um, when, I'm, when I'm working on something, I try and wake up like at five or five thirty in the morning, which Ooh. after a week or two, I can start to do without an alarm. Interesting. Um, and does that mean I go to bed very early? Yes, it does. But yeah. like, um, it's a give and take. You no, know, because what I learned during the pandemic was that if I did that, if I got up, I got some iced coffee and sat down, and like I would read for maybe five or ten minutes something very intentional, something that is like keyed into the tone that I'm trying to get to mm -hmm. and then immediately started working and if I would work for the one and a half to two hours that that would give me before my girlfriend would wake up smart um that that got me pretty close to a day's worth of work for for writing because that's the that's the, the, the truth about it you know is is um you're not putting in an eight hour day of writing like yeah who has the brain capacity for that? No, when that's certainly not me. And, and it's particularly not when you're talking about like that stage, that creative stage, mm -hmm. um, which I do try and differentiate. Like it's hard for me to like be creative in the morning and then edit at night, which I know oh, some yeah. people can do. But like, like I said, I, I always have to deal with this very critical cop voice in my head. And so I kind of need him knocked out and not engaged when I'm, when I'm, and then you do the part later where you like, fiddle and, and tone and, 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 and allow yourself that guy to come out and, and he's an essential part of the process, but I need to keep those things separate. But like mm -hmm. either way, I, I can do that part a little longer, but um, yeah, you know, um, work for a couple hours, go have breakfast, maybe work until lunch. And then 
do all those other things that to an outsider don't look like work and I'm not going to act like it's hard. Sure. Um, but like, I watch a lot of movies. I, I research. Yeah. Genuinely. It genuinely is. And, and, and again, it, it's about that cultivation. I, I should exercise more The everything everybody says about exercise and creativity is true. Yeah. You know, um, but like, again, the eight hour workday is just made up. Facts. It's just made up. You know, that I, I mean, I'm outside my depths here, but my belief is, is that nobody in like a hunter gatherer culture hunted and gathered for eight hours a day. Yeah, I bet you're right. Um, <laughs> and this idea that you need to model yourself after like the amount of time that an employer could make you, could force you to work without giving you a second meal break, which is essentially what the eight hour workday right. is. Yeah. Um, is that's just silly like you don't have to hold yourself to that and again like why like on your on your deathbed <laughs> are you going to be like well i put in the hours that's um, right <laughs> no 60 worked for me mm-hmm. <laughs> You're like what because you know again like this is uh, again i'm working on my new newsletter and, and the sun was a worry about getting too like uh treacly but like not only is this the only life you're given you're the only you that's given to life Yep. So like, yeah, you're right. You have to hold those two things in balance and not let that second part like curdle into narcissism and go like, yeah, right. Me. It's yeah. Like, no, that's everybody. That's <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. There's still an ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and none of that makes you above people it just makes you a person. But right. like, um, you know, I just think like that's, that's the thing to like cultivate. And, and again, it's, it's done wonders, frankly, for my anxiety and for my, um, great my productivity to to keep focusing on these things that i think are much it's work but it's it's a more natural like something i said in the newsletter is it should feel like work like lifting some like by doing a bench press of a weight you can handle as opposed to like trying to lift a car off of somebody which is right what writing feels like when i'm blocked makes sense you know um but by redefining these things and saying, well, no, no, you're just trying to create a vivid and sustained dream that can be transmitted into somebody else's head. And you know how to do that. And you've absorbed enough of this stuff to do it yourself. And just do that. That's it. Just do that. And, uh, and will it sell? I don't, know. I don't know, man, but like, you can't control that. Right. Um, that's for future you to worry about. That's right. And yeah. even future you, you're, you, at the end of the day, like, you can do the work, you can show up, all that, and then you have to like, uh, like let luck take over. You know? Right. It's out of his hands. This is like the most inspirational thing that somebody has uh, said to me recently. And, and uh, I'm, I'm really trying to keep it in mind. A friend of mine was, you know, and I, I can't get too many details, but like in a sure. Hollywood situation where it's like, oh, it doesn't look like this thing is going to happen, you know, and, and, and she was getting down on herself about the thing not happening. And her executive, who, who's, who's a, a good person, was like, hey, you know, like it worked out for this famous person, it worked out for that famous person. And, and my friend said, yeah, well, they got lucky. And the executive said to her, well, why can't you be lucky, bitch? Ooh, I like that a lot. I know this executive, too. And I'm thinking about reaching out to her and going, like, can I like, steal that? Like, yeah. can I, like, <laughs> like, that's really like, why can't you be lucky, bitch? Like, yeah. And it's a good question to ask yourself as you, as you, as you do these things. It's like, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but Hey, you could get lucky, bitch. Like it just as likely really, <laughs> you know, that's amazing. Yeah. I love that. Well, dude, this has been great. Yeah. Very so, fun, man. You're a gem. This is so fun. So, Thank but, you but so much. before I get, before I release you into the wild, I had to ask where can people find you online? Where can they find your books, your newsletter? Talk sure. Um, welcome to the hat hammer party. It's on Substack. Um, I think just Google welcome to the hammer party, which is a phrase that popped in my head one day. And I just, I that's love the it. title for something. Um, I'm on Twitter. It's Jordan underscore Harper on Twitter. Um, the guy who got Jordan Harper is a British uh, astrophysicist who occasionally uh, fair. has to direct people my way. I'm like, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, those are the two things, you know, um, she rides shotgun and love and other wounds are available at least on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Last King of California is coming out in the UK 
2022. Uh, I don't know when it'll be in America. That's like a whole long saga. Sure. Um, and then, the, yeah, everybody knows it's going to be early 2023. Very excited about that. And uh, that's kind of, yeah, uh, watch Hightown. I just, yep. uh, I was on season one of Hightown. Uh, scheduling wouldn't let me be on season two, sure. unfortunately, but season two just uh, finished airing. And uh, and uh, that was my most recent TV gig that um, made it to air. Amazing. Yeah, that, that's how you find me. I love it. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.